All right, welcome back to ABA exam review in our BCBA task list series. Today we're talking about respondent and operant conditioning, which is B3 in concepts and principles. As always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Let us know when you pass so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. So we're going to start with respondent behavior. Respondent behavior is going to be perhaps maybe a small portion of your exam. And in practice, we really don't even deal with respondent behavior all that much, but it's extremely important as it relates so well to operant conditioning and how we view operant conditioning and operant behavior. So what is respondent behavior? Respondent behavior are essentially these reflexes that are unconditioned. We enter the world equipped with reflexes to specific stimuli. We blink, we get aroused, we get hungry, we sweat, we sneeze, we cough, we shiver. Most of these really are evolutionary traits. They help us survive. They help us continue. They're unconditioned reflexes. And what we need to remember about respondent behavior is they're not consequence dependent. So if we look at our contingency for respondent, it's just an SR. It's a stimulus response contingency. There is no consequences because these reflexes are going to persist consequence or not. So consequences don't impact respondent behavior. It's a very important thing to remember. So if the eliciting stimulus is presented repeatedly, the magnitude of the reflex will diminish. This is what we mean by habituation. For example, if I shine a light in your eyes, initially you might blink. If I keep doing it, that rapid blinking might slow. If you hear a loud clap of thunder, you might jump really high. If you hear a lot of claps of thunder in a row, that jumping, the magnitude of that jumping is going to diminish. That is habituation. What you want to remember about respondent behavior is we are dealing with reflexes that are elicited. When we get to operant behavior, we're dealing with responses that are evoked. Very, very important distinction when talking about the two different types of behavior. Which brings us to our question. What are the key words when discussing respondent behavior? A, reflex. Yes, reflex instead of response, because it's, it's, these are reflexes, right? These are reflexes that are unconditioned. Elicit, not evoked, okay? Reflexes are elicited by these antecedent stimulus or stimuli. Evoke has to do with operant behavior. The key words are both A and B, reflex and elicit. So when talking about respondent conditioning, this is what gives people trouble, but you have to practice a few of these, make out your own diagrams, make out your own drawings. But when you break it down, it's really, really quite straightforward. All right. So essentially neutral stimuli are gaining the ability to elicit reflexes, there's our phrase, through respondent conditioning. It's the same thing as Pavlov, Pavlovian conditioning, and classical conditioning. So when thinking respondent conditioning, okay, these are when these are where our our letters come into play, right? Uh in your ABA course, you might have seen all those diagrams or linking unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned reflexes. Can get confusing. Let's break it down, right? First things first. Unconditioned stimuli, or US, elicit unconditioned reflexes. You, the sun shines in your eyes, blink. You get scared, your heart starts racing. These are unconditioned stimuli eliciting these reflexes. Now, we want to take a neutral stimulus, an NS, with no properties and combine it with an unconditioned stimuli. So let's combine the sound of a bell with a the sound of thunder, right? So thunder is unconditioned stimulus that makes you jump. And so we're going to ring a bell and thunder is going to happen at the same time. We're going to start pairing those things. And through pairing, we're going to create a conditioned stimulus. And that conditioned stimulus is going to scare you, which is now a conditioned reflex. And I think this is where people get a little confused, okay? They understand, right, we have an unconditioned stimuli. We pair it with the neutral stimuli. We can we create a conditioned stimulus. This conditioned reflex is the same as the unconditioned reflex, except for a conditioned reflex is, evo is elicited by a conditioned stimulus. An unconditioned reflex is elicited by an unconditioned stimulus. I think that's where people mix it up the most. All right. So again, a conditioned reflex is elicited by a conditioned stimulus. An unconditioned reflex is elicited by an unconditioned stimulus. So if we just look at our letters here, right, we have unconditioned stimulus elicits unconditioned reflex. 
we pair the unconditioned stimulus with the neutral stimulus. It elicits the unconditioned reflex. And then our conditioned stimulus elicits the conditioned reflex. So question, Jim plays a sound on his computer and then offers Dwight an Altoid. The Altoid causes Dwight to salivate. After several rounds of this, the sound of the computer caused Dwight to salivate. Prior to this, the computer sound was a what? Okay, prior to this, prior to what? Prior to the conditioning, right? So let's mark these down, okay? Jim plays a sound on his computer, which is our neutral stimulus. He offers Dwight an Altoid, which causes Dwight to salivate. So the Altoid is an unconditioned stimulus. Salivation is an unconditioned reflex. So he's combining the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus, right? And it's eliciting this unconditioned reflex. After several rounds of this, the sound of the computer caused Dwight to salivate. So the sound became a conditioned stimulus. This, causing Dwight to salivate, became a conditioned reflex. So prior to that conditioning, the computer sound was a neutral stimulus. It was never an unconditioned stimulus. It became a conditioned stimulus after pairing. Prior to pairing, it was neutral and it was never a reflex. So do a few like this where you're writing out using the, the letters, all right? And don't spend too much time on this, but you need to have a, a pretty basic idea of what classical conditioning is. Other notes, respondent extinction occurs when you present the CS repeatedly in the absence of the US. Basically, if Jim presented that computer sound over and over again without the Altoid, the sound will lose its property. And then higher order conditioning occurs when CS, so conditioned stimulus, are paired with neutral stimulus to create more CS. So instead of taking an unconditioned stimulus, pairing it with a neutral stimulus, now you're taking a conditioned stimulus to create more conditioned stimuli. Now, on to operant behavior. And this is where your primary concern should lie because throughout the rest of the task list, pretty much, is we're, we're talking about operant behavior, operant conditioning, on and on. All right, so this is, this is our focus. So operant behavior is behavior that is created, conditioned, and determined by learning and consequence history. Okay. Consequences control future operant behavior. Consequences determine operant behavior. Consequences create operant behavior. This is what we mean by determine, right? Behavior happens for a reason. It's lawful. These consequences maintain and continue or discontinue affect operant behavior in the future. So applied behavior analysis primarily deals with operant behavior. These are things like talking, walking, playing an instrument, counting, cooking, socializing. Unlike reflexes, right, which are just we we are born with, right? These are all learned. Okay, these are all learned behaviors. Operant behavior is learned. These responses are selected, shaped, and maintained by consequences. Notice the difference, right? We have our SRS contingency. Now we have consequences. ABC are consequences. Compare that to what? Just the SR, okay, without a consequence. So the key difference between respondent and operant is really these consequences which are maintaining these behaviors. So we define operant behavior by its function, but also we can describe its topography of magnitude. So what are, our, what are typical consequences? Well, punishment and reinforcement, right? Punishment decreases future. Reinforcement increases future. Okay, we're dealing with an SRS contingency. Which of the following terms should we use when describing operant behavior? Response, yes. Evoke. Yes. Elicit. No. Elicit and reflex have to do with respondent. Response and evoke have to do with operant. And I know we're being picky here, but it's very important on the exam. And when talking about it, that you use the right terminology. So operant conditioning, much more straightforward than respondent because you deal with it all, all the time. It's what we deal with in practice. Okay. It's simply a consequence alters the occurrence of a type of response in the future. What it's saying is reinforcement, okay, increases, punishment, decreases, right? Consequences, reinforcement or punishment, alter the occurrence of a type of response in the future. Now, a couple of things. Consequences affect future behavior. Consequences can't change behavior that already happened. Consequences select response classes, not individual responses. 
Meaning when you reinforce a response, you're really reinforcing resp that response and responses that serve the same function. Okay, it'll look similar because two responses rarely look identical. Okay, so you're really reinforcing a response class, not these individual responses. Immediate consequences are most effective. That's what we mean by contiguity, the closeness of the reinforcement to the behavior. So um, when the when the response happens, you want the consequence, okay, to happen as soon as possible. Consequences can select any behavior, which again is, is why it's important to be quick because when you deliver that consequence, it can reinforce or punish really any behavior that happened right before. And then operant conditioning occurs with or without awareness from the learner. This is called automaticity of reinforcement. So you, a behavior analyst, tell your technicians to deliver reinforcement quicker after the response occurs. What are you concerned with? Well, we're, we're concerned with this contiguity, right? We want the immediate consequence because it's most effective. So if we need to deliver reinforcement quicker after the response occurs, we're not worried about shaping, motivating operations or antecedents. We're dealing with consequences, so we're not, uh, not responding behavior. We're worried about this contiguity of this reinforcement. Finally, okay, just some final notes, recap. Respondent, SR, no consequence. Operant, as is SR. Consequence is what matters. Respondent reflexes are unconditioned and elicited. Okay. Operant responses are learned and evoked. Respondent conditioning deals with letters, unconditioned stimuli, unconditioned reflex, conditioned stimuli, conditioned reflex, and neutral stimuli. Operant conditioning deals with reinforcement and punishment, but neutral stimuli can become reinforcers or punishers of conditioning. So, as always, we want to simplify this stuff as much as possible. Okay. Huge distinction between these two things. Our focus is operant, but you've got to know the basics, at least this part, of respondent. Great. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. Let us know when you pass so we can include you in our Sunday shout-out. As always, like, subscribe, work hard, study hard. See you soon.